Hello, it's Cherie Burton. Welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness. This is a podcast for women who long to feel, express, and be who they truly are. Today, we've got Cassie Parks. She's going to help us bust through some of our money issues, some of the issues we have around receiving abundance. The big thing about the feminine is we're all about receiving and holding space and being containers. And a lot of our beliefs keep us from really embodying and ensouling generosity and benevolence, which is, you know, that queen archetype we talk a lot about on my podcast of just owning your space, sitting on your throne, if you will, just being in your domains in life and having abundance. And you could say wealth is more of a state of mind than it is anything else sort of creating your money story. And we're going to define what that means, but you can find her website, CassieParks.com. And she has got some good stuff on Amazon, manifest $10,000, double your business. All of that stuff is in the show notes. Suffice it to say, she has been on this journey, which we will detail together of finding the inner wealth, finding the money mindset, being intentional about designing your life, This is an entrepreneurial journey I've been on, being raised with a lot of poverty just because of the times and also because, you know, my parents were forging their own way and had a lot of children and my beginnings were fraught with not enough. And so that actually propelled me as an adult to create because I knew that wasn't my birthright. So we just talk a lot about the preoccupation with lack and how that feeds into how we receive. Hop onto my website and download my free healing kit just on shereeburton.com forward slash healing kit or it'll pop right up when you head to my website. I've got some good stuff that are on multi-sensory wellness and healing digital versions that you can download that and, and use that as a resource to kind of get in your body and get into the right mindset. Hey, Cassie, welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness. This is a, this is a topic I've been wanting to address for a while. I'm glad you're with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really honored and excited to be on this show. Yay. Well, okay. So let's kind of start with, because this whole thing about money, I mean, you say the word money and it's an energetic charge Mm -hmm. for people. And a lot of it is based around how we were raised and the program we got. We'll get into that in a minute. But I'm more curious in starting with why this is relevant for you, why this morphed into kind of like your life mission and why you started teaching what you're teaching about it. How did that show up for you? Awesome. Uh, So it really started, I was um, 19 and I went to work for this company and there was this potential for like to make a hundred thousand dollars. There's, there was that with that company. And there was this thing that I learned, which was financial independence. And that's having enough passive income to be able to pay your bills and to not have to go to work. And to me, that's what drew me in because I had watched, um, my dad worked a lot and when I, what I knew as an adult is that it was a different interpretation than I had as a kid. Like, yes, he did work a lot and he worked hard. He did, he liked it, um, to some degree, probably would have liked to work less, but it wasn't as, um, bad as I thought it was, but I always had in my mind, um, that, you know, you have to work so hard just to make it like all these hours. And then my dad, when I had turned, you know, 16, we had a conversation and he told me, you know, Um, He was actually making over $100,000 and he told me the percentage of people that did that. And he told me in the course of this conversation, you know, I got lucky seven times in my career. And so, you know, from kind of that moment, you know, to when I found this company at 19, I was like, how am I ever how can I ever repeat that? I don't want to work that hard. I know that. And how do you like make sure you get lucky? Right. Mm -hmm. And so there was sort of this opening at 19 and it took a while to come back around. But what I really did, I always wanted to have my own business. Um, I thought I wanted to be a counselor, but I realized, um, you know, when I was in school to be a counselor that I wanted to be a coach, I wanted something faster. I didn't actually know what I wanted at that point yet. And, but as I tried to build my business, what I did was I knew I had to change my money story. And I, I knew that I knew there was a couple different courses. There was a couple different things I got introduced to. And I realized like I wanted financial independence and I also didn't want to work as hard as my dad had worked. And I believe in, you know, hard work and commitment, but I didn't want to work 
12 hours, six days a week. That just wasn't what I wanted to do. And I had to really change my story and change a lot of the beliefs that I had about money. And so I worked on that. And when I was 32, I quote unquote retired from my corporate job. That's what my friends called it uh, because I had enough passive income for my real estate investments to pay my bills, to not um, replace my salary that I had been making, but to pay my bills so that I could quit work and go build my coaching practice that I had wanted to build. And I had no idea that it would be money that if you would have told me that's what it was, I probably would have told you you were crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, But as I, (laughs) when I um, quit my job, uh, you know, money was different. And I was, and I knew enough to know like, okay, there's some thoughts running through your head. Like, even though everything's taken care of, I was having some, some mind chatter and some stuff going on. And I said, I need to do this program that I wrote six months ago. So I I had outlined it. I wrote it and I said, I'm going to do it. And then I'm going to release it. And what happened is that was a super, um, it's now called manifest 10 K. It was really successful. And that became what people wanted to learn from me. They wanted to learn more about money manifesting and mindset. And then it was also, I really saw this need of what it needs to change. Like you said, there's this emotional charge around money, like even just saying it that so many um, people have. And I wanted to open the door that there's so much more possible and there's so much more good and there's so much possibility with money. Hmm. Yeah. You know, I had to do my own work around this, um, really briefly. Uh, my listeners probably don't have never even really heard me talk about this, but I knew when I was very young, I'm the second oldest of seven children. My dad was a police officer. My mom was a stay at home mom. There was a time we had five children in a single white trailer. Um, we, I lived in poverty for a lot of years, but I also saw a mother who was very resourceful and who baked bread and did a paper route. There was a time that my sisters and I helped my mom clean high school bathrooms when I was in elementary school. So I remember seeing my beautiful mother clean a toilet and I went, that's not my birthright. That's not hers. So it's kind of like what you're saying where you watched your dad kind of work super hard and, and maybe he loved what he did, but, but you also knew that there was a different way that um, I didn't even know the word entrepreneur existed until I was like in my 30s. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> like I didn't even, I didn't even understand it. I just knew that something in my soul knew that I wanted to be wealthy. I wanted to create that. I, I wanted beauty and abundance around me. I just didn't, you know, have, I couldn't articulate it back then. But as I, um, I'm kind of like you too. I thought I was going to be a therapist or a counselor. Isn't that what you said? That you thought you were going on that track? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually got an undergraduate degree in psychology with the intent that I would just be a stay-at-home mom and um, take clients around my kids' schedules. And I'm so grateful that it didn't morph into that for me. Uh, There were a lot of uh, indicators that I would be doing something really untraditional. And so I actually ended up doing direct selling and um, built a very successful global uh, doTERRA team. I don't know if you've heard of doTERRA, but it's essential oils. And, I have. Um, That's awesome. Almonds. Yeah. So now I have a team all over. In fact, I'm going to Korea uh, later this month, or actually this will air in February. So I'm going to Korea literally right as this episode airs. And um, I go to Australia, New Zealand, um, most a lot of Asian countries, Japan. And what has been interesting because you said something um, that kind of sparked from what it was for me um, that when you started down the path of talking about money or when you started teaching mm-hmm. about it, you attracted mm-hmm. people like they were because for you it was like a passion and then they like mm-hmm. hitched to your wagon because it was so passionate for you. One of the things that I found is, yeah, people were very passionate about learning the emotional healing stuff I teach and learning how to do healing holistically and things like that. But when I, when I worked with people in business, when I um, started talking about my story and I started talking about why wealth is, there's a different way to be wealthy. um, It was like, the light bulbs were turning on all over with women, mothers. Um, it's like, oh, I guess that's okay. Mm. I guess it is maybe even kind of spiritual. 
And so the awakening around that kind of coincided if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna think globally, if I'm gonna think about reaching more people, if I'm gonna think about healing, I have to get clear on money. I have to get clear on this resource because we can't live without it, right? It it's it's a right. fact of life. <laughs> and people demonize it. It is. People demonize it. Yeah. Especially if you have a really religious um paradigm or you know, if you were brought up a certain way to think about people that are rich. Um cultures really, really, really do, um, influence the way that we see money. Um, okay. So let's start with, okay. So is there anything about, else about your story? So you, so you created kind of this, um, following or program based around how you started to see changing the money story. And then it probably created more abundance for you as a natural extension of that, right? You, <laughs> ironically enough. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, I did it and um, then I released it. And so before I had quit my job, one of the things is I just didn't feel like I had the time, the energy, even to put into the the kind of creation. I always hit this stopping. Like I couldn't build my coaching business. I was trying to build it. Um when I was working and I just hit this place. And finally I was like, you know, I had this moment with myself. It's like, what do you really want? And I'm like, I want to be free. And so I went to work on, on that part and said, I'll do that business when I'm free and I don't have to go to work. And so, um, you know, I had never before in my business, I had released, you know, I had a $47 product that I had gotten two people to buy. And when I really, when I did manifest 10 K, which was originally called money, 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 I had 270 people enrolled in the first um, program. Wow. And I had made five figures from that. Yeah. And so it was hugely, um, you know, just being in that and being open and, um, you know, I did, a, I did other things that supported, you know, being a successful entrepreneur, which is, I teach a lot about that today too, scripting and, and seeing the people and really becoming the person who was a successful entrepreneur. But yeah, it attracted money to me. And um, the program when it originally came out was pay after you manifest. So I didn't even charge up front. I said, you can take the course and you pay me 10% of whatever you manifest, which would be over and above like, you know, your salary or whatever um, in 90 days. Hmm. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. So nine. Okay. We can, and you have offerings to direct people to how they can um, align with some of those teachings and how you present that. Obviously we'll put some notes in our show notes. Uh, what? Okay. So when we're talking about a money story, we're talking about mm -hmm. like, everyone's got a narrative around this resource we call money. And um, my old, I'll mm -hmm. tell you, my old narrative was that the more, the less, the less things you had and the less money you had, the more humble and spiritual you were. So that was one. The other one, and even though it's all yeah. over in biblical scripture, how God gives people wealth, it's all over the place. Abraham, you know, it's, it's just there. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and then the second, the second, uh, like really mixed up belief I had about money is that it, it would like, if you've got, it's kind of the, along the lines of the first one, like you would usurp power over people and you would be this like. I'm not like a dictator, but kind of like, I just thought of like an emperor who's just like haughty and prideful and um, really above the people, right? That's just um, kind of like mm -hmm. sold their soul. <laughs> so it really kind of is the same thing. As yeah. The one. And um, the, the new belief now is that um, the more you have, the more you can give. And one of my yes. favorite, favorite, favorite books on abundance, and I'm sure you've probably read it, is Marianne Williamson's The Law of Divine Compensation. Are you familiar with that one? I'm actually not. I haven't read it. Oh, okay. Well, check Let's, it out. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, you know who she is, right? She's like... She was running yes. for president. I don't know if she's still in the ring, but she mm -hmm. was, she's one of my favorite spiritual teachers. I followed her for many years, but there was a quote in there that has stuck with me. And it is, 
Purity of heart is the greatest engine of wealth creation. Purity of heart is the greatest Mm. engine of wealth creation. And so that's the new paradigm for me now. Like it's what would I, how would I give back? Um, One of the, one of the greatest gifts of receiving is how you give. It's that the more you give, the more you receive, the more you receive, the more you give, et cetera. That's like a cycle that keeps coming back to you. But anyway, I just want to say those were my old beliefs And uh, I really had to challenge those because I probably the first person in my family, my sister and I together actually journeyed in this together, but we are the first in our family in generations that created wealth and never to our knowledge did a woman ever do that. And we're talking men and women. So we Mm -hmm. sort of broke that cycle in our family of looking at money a different way, number one, and then also creating wealth through the through a mission through pure intent through service based um teaching and healing work honestly um okay mm-hmm. so i'm curious if you were to def- cuz i know it's probably obvious what a money story is but i'm really curious how you would define it what it is and how we create them and, and then we'll get into like how you can write write the new one yeah So um, the money story is what's driving your experience of money. So most people think it's about, well, how much money do I let come into my life? But it's all, it's also about how much do you keep? What do you spend it on? How quickly do you get rid of it? Like, are you investing in your happiness? Are you investing for another reason? So I always use the word invest instead of spend. Um, But it's really encompasses this whole experience. It's the story that outlines the entire experience that you're going to have, right? And that for me, um, it's the title really is says um, says what's what's happening with money. And the way I didn't come up with these beforehand. What happened is I was teaching and I was teaching people how to manifest more money. And I started to interview um, clients that were willing and wanted to share their story with others about how they'd manifested money. And one day I just started asking the question, like, what was your money story before? And then I kept asking that question. And as I kept interviewing, I saw really five main money stories that seemed to be the default. Like if we don't consciously choose... um, from you know our depths and a place of like how do we want our money story how do we want our whole experience of money what we give what we save what we invest in how it comes to us we don't choose that consciously like how do we you know that we sort of just pick up there was there's five main that i saw and we can go into those if we want later but um i just saw them come out and they're the things that drive everything so even when more money so many people think if i could just have more money right if i just get a raise everything will be fixed and if a lot of people have probably realized if you're listening to this it doesn't it doesn't happen that $5000 or that $1000 doesn't generally fix the problem and that's because the story overrides the amount i have seen these money stories play out, you know, when somebody's making $3,000 a month and $300,000 a month, because it's the story and it's what we do with it. It's not the amount that really um, changes our experience. Mm. So you said the five things that, what was it, what was it again? The five things that generate. Uh, So the five stories that I have found after interviewing tons of people, when I ask, you know, what was your former money story? So one is survival. Um, and this is a per, like, so generally a lot of times people with this story, they, they might've picked it up when it was survival in their house growing up. Right. And whether or not they have a good job, they still live in, or, you know, and they can pay all their bills. They live in survival mode. Um, they do what I call hot potato money. So money comes in and they get, if it's extra, they get rid of it really fast. Mm -hmm. Um, because they only know, you know, sort of how to be in that adrenaline survival thing. Um, And then there's just enough, which is a lot like survival, but it's not stressful. It's just sort of blah. Like when somebody is a just enough story, they, they know that if the car breaks down magically, a thousand dollars is going to show up to fix it. But they also know if they get a $500 bonus, the water heater is going to break and take up that $500. And so it's not stressful because it always works out, but they don't plan and dream big because there's always just enough money. 
Um, and then there's the hold tight, which are the people that just want to hold on so tight. They are never enjoying their money. Oftentimes they think they're saving money. They'll do things like, I heard this story from one woman one time who this was her story. And she slept like on the floor for six months because she knew this mattress that she wanted would go on sale in six months. And she had the money. She had more than enough money because she's a hold tight. And generally they have a lot of money in the bank, but they, but she just couldn't, you know, like saving the hundred dollars was worth sleeping on the floor, you know, for her for six months. Um, because saving the buck is really where you get that sort of high, that energy about money rather than the experiences that happen in your life because of money. Um, and then there's the hot mess and the hot mess is really, um, this ends up being, <laughs> yeah. And it's not for most people who are a hot mess. They've always been okay with money. Um, it's always worked out. They've never had to be stressed about it. And so they just sort of spend because they know it's going to come in. But then there comes a point in a day where they're like, Oh, I feel like I should have more to show for this. You know, like it's always worked out, but I don't have the amount I want in the bank or I don't have this. And then that one, it really becomes probably the, uh, it's a deep spiritual journey when your story was originally hot mess. They're all spiritual, but that one is a little bit, um, just tends to be deeper. People have to go on a deeper spiritual path for that one because it's just a little bit different. And then there's the money chaser, which I was, um, it was a combo of the hot mess and the money chaser, depending on different points in my life. <laughs> and the money chaser is the person who's, who's always chasing money, right? They're always chasing that idea. They've joined like, you know, five, different companies and that's going to be the one and they're you know they always have a new idea and their family's really tired of hearing about all their ideas uh -huh. and they never come to fruition yeah <laughs> but they're always they're always chasing it um and so those are kind of those are the five that i've seen um where people sort of default um and then as we grow and we start to change our beliefs about money and attract more money and choose our beliefs instead of taking those default ones and those default stories um that everybody writes uh what i love is everybody ends up writing their own unique story like we sort of default as humans to these ones and i, I haven't figured out why yet um but as we write our own beautiful new story, they're very unique. Mm. So what are the ways that we can craft a new story? So let's say you identified one of these five ways of being around money and, um, and there, and you know, you can literally trace sometimes what people have said to you about money or people who have money or whatever. And you could probably come up with a bunch of adjectives like exploitive, prideful, whatever. Uh, but how do you bridge into a new story, creating a new money story? Yeah. So um, the way that I do it with my clients, is we actually set out to attract more money. We actually set out to um, attract $10,000 in 90 days. Um, and so the reason that this works, so it, A, you become aware of your story, but we don't want to put more energy into our story. A lot of times the, what people think is like, oh, okay, if I'm a, you know, if I'm a hot mess, I got to go fix that. I got to, you know, do all of these things to fix that. But what we're really doing is putting that energy on the thing that needs to be fixed instead of on what we want to be created. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I use $10,000 is it came out of the original, um, you know, course that I created. Once I did money, money, money for a while, I realized that 10000 was really sort of a sweet spot for people. It's big enough that you don't know how $10,000 is just going to show up in 90 days, but it's not too big that your brain goes, whoa, we can't do this and sort of drops the ball. Um, and when you're moving towards more money and you're celebrating all the money that shows up and you, um, you know, you start to look for money and you look for the evidence that, that people are good with money, that money comes easily to people, that um, people are ha more happier when they have money or, you know, all the things that you look for throughout the course, you really start to develop in a natural way, new beliefs about money. It's almost and like you're ways courting, just, you're writing a story. Yeah, I was going to say, it kind of reminds me of like developing a new relationship. You have to make it your friend. You you have to take all the stigma around yes. it and just 
look at it for what it is and develop this new friendship, really. Yes. Yeah. I love looking at it that way. And that is what it is, right? So you like, I I love that you said new because we're looking at it in a new way. Instead of bringing all that old stuff, we're new. What do I want from this? What do I see that's awesome from this? What is amazing? What can I do with this? How is this going to support me? How am I going to support it? Yeah, that's great because I know you're also getting ready to come out with a book on relationship later this month. How did, and and I'm curious Mm -hmm. about that, you know, the, I guess the, um, the link between how you develop this relationship with money and then now the power, I guess you're asking like power of asking for what you want in a relationship. That's kind of your expertise. So how did, how did that happen? I see them very, very symbiotic. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, for sure. Um, And I think they they are very symbiotic. And when you learn to ask for what you want in one area, it's easier to ask in the other and it um, rolls over. So I, um, you know, I've studied the law of attraction for a long time and done a lot of work with it. And um, we use that when it comes to money and developing that new relationship. And... uh, that also went into um, creating what I teach really in depthly as well. We lay a money story foundation, a money foundation, and then I teach um, scripting to create the life that you want and to really attract that um, from a new place. And so I've been teaching for a while about this in relationships and I did it on my own sort of, it just naturally happened. It was one of the things I wanted to attract into my life. And so I started writing about a relationship and I started writing about the depth of the experience because when most people, it's the same with money. You know, when you ask people, what do you want money for? Or what do you want? They'll say more money. But when you say, what do you want it for? Like, Oh, a new car or to give or to this, but most people don't have that depth of experience. And what makes it magic is when you get into the depth of what is it going to feel like to be in that car? Or what is it going to feel like to write your favorite charity, a thousand dollar check? And who are you going to be that day? Mm-hmm. And so that's the same with the relationship. I really, that's part of how, you know, the process that my clients go through and I went through with changing money changing my money story and creating more money. And the same was true with the relationship. I was like, I have to know how to be the person I want to be in a relationship in order to attract the relationship that I want. I have to know the experience, not just that I want, you know, to be happy and it to be fun and, you know, for them to be cute and all these things. It's like, you had to, I have to have what is that experience? What does fun mean? What does that mean on a Saturday? Mm-hmm. Right? What does that look like in terms of life? And so I, I started adding that into my scripts as well. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, I, on a whim, just said, I want to teach this. It was my birthday month. And I said, I'm just going to do this workshop. I don't know if I'll ever do it again. Uh, but I put it together and it was all about um, relationships. And scripting and attracting the relationship that you wanted. And I've continued to do it. And the thing that I've seen is super powerful is that when women ask for that depth of what they want in a relationship and they script it and they become the woman who has what they want and who's willing to receive fully what they want, like it changes everything else on a whole other level. It makes money show up faster. It helps their businesses grow faster. It just helps them love their moms more and their kids and everything else just gets better when they're willing to ask for this depth of what they want. And so that's what we do. And so I'm now putting it in a book to share it with even more people. That's awesome. You know, I recently was listening to a podcast. I don't know if you're familiar with John Gottman. He and his wife, Julie, are kind of the foremost relationship marriage experts in the country. But they said that typically the number one reason people divorce is because of money. And it can create such a strain within Mm -hmm. relationships when two people come together with different money stories, right? And you're trying to, you know, run a household or manage money or budget. So what would you say um, that you found to kind of create peace within relationships, especially with people that are living together or married, that are mixing funds (laughs) or that are um, coming from two different, completely different paradigms, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the first one I'll say, so like if when 
people are clients of mine or they do the program, uh, I've had lots of stories where it's like, I changed and everything changed. So that's like, first and foremost, I want to say like, we don't have to, it doesn't, you know, a lot of people will go in like, oh, I can't change the way that the finances are because, you know, my husband or my partner or my wife doesn't want to do X, Y, Z, right? Um, but if you change, everything changes. And so I have lots of examples of that. There's, I think it's even close to like a title on my podcast, How to Manifest When Your Husband's a Spender. Um, that's proof of that. If anyone wants to know it's possible, um, I love to give people proof of possibility. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is to to get clear. So often what we, we don't understand each other's money stories, right? So the first step I would take is like, learn your, your partner's money story, like learn why they do the things that they do. Right. And then have a conversation about like, okay, well, where do we want to go? What do we want? How do we want to be handling money? Like, what do we want in five years, in 10 years and start to move towards that. And often the, the thing that people want to do is like, oh, well, this isn't going right. Or we can't do this, or you're not doing it right. And when it becomes more of a conversation and you look at it as an evolution, you know, that it doesn't have to change next month because the story didn't get created. The, the default that your partner is running on didn't get default, de- didn't get created in a day. So understand that them writing a new story and you writing one together is going to take a little while. Give yourself, okay, who do you want to be in five years? And it's just continually evolving and having those hard conversations. That's not necessarily you're doing it wrong or you're not doing it right. Um, but is, okay, is this part of your money story? And how do we put something in place that changes that, right? Mm-hmm. So if somebody is a, a survival, like if a partner, one, one partner is a survival, but one person maybe has a good money story and they like to save money, right? Telling somebody like, when I save money, that makes me feel safe and understanding, oh, I grew up in survival. So there's, you know, I'm 10, you know, seeing that they tend to get rid of money. Great. How can you maybe take money out of an account um, so that there's not a lot of extra money that's sort of seen? You know, what can you put in place to help somebody with survival so they're not trying to hot potato money, Right. And it's just a constant conversation. And I think the main thing is that people want it different. Number one, they want it different overnight. Um, They're not, they don't see that it it needs to be an evolution over time because it didn't get this way overnight. And number two, that to really take the time to understand what was your partner's money story? Like, what do they believe about money? You know, understanding why somebody, um, and somebody must need to hear about survival story because that's what keeps popping into my head. But, you know, somebody who has a survival story, you know, that, that there wasn't money, you know, there either was money and everything was okay, or there wasn't money and everything was frantic and understand how they became who they became. And then you have more compassion for supporting them and changing the money story and creating the money story that you want as a couple. Yeah. You know, um, I remember because it's coming from such a large family. Um, it's interesting how the scarcity mentality can just be running amok. You know, it's a survival instinct. It's like, yeah, you know, if your parents bring home a box of cold cereal with sugar, like Captain Crunch, I mean, it's gone in two seconds. If you do not f- grab the box, fill your bowl up and snarf it down and fill it up again, you know, it's that, it's that same kind of um, almost like a panic sets in or, hey, if I don't, if I don't, Mm -hmm. I think your first one was about this, like if I don't spend it, it's going to go away. Um, I think it was about the, 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 I don't know if that was the money chaser or the hot mess, but yeah, there's an element of, um, you know, for instance, my, my husband and I, so he, his father comes from a long, long line of entrepreneurs. He has like five brothers and they're all entrepreneurs. His dad's an entrepreneur. His dad's never had a boss. My husband's never had a boss, our whole marriage. We've been married almost 25 years. And, um, he has, my husband himself, um, has never had a boss. (laughs) And so I, I think we're both together, very entrepreneurial that way. We want, we value freedom, especially time freedom. So um, getting into spaces where we can think bigger and think globally, it's been a challenge because of, I mean, he didn't have the block that I did, you know, not having the 
the benefit, like health benefits, like of insurance or 401k or any of that stuff. And uh, <laughs> secure, but security is a big thing for women. Wouldn't you say that women need security? Um, not that we can't flip into a provider role really fast, uh, but it, it, somehow money to us means security. Have you seen that at all? Mm, I don't, um, I work with mostly women and I see all of it. I see that sometimes they don't, you know, they have just as much of a survival. I need to get rid of it or, um, story. I'm sure that it can, it makes totally makes sense that they would want uh, more security just from an evolutionary standpoint. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I guess I'm saying that just because, you know, I work with a lot of mothers who are trying to, um, convince mm. themselves it's okay to kind of like leave the nest and go in and wear that hat of, yeah. and because their soul is calling them to do something and they are like, this is so risky. Yes. Uh, if I just stay here in this really safe space, um, you know, so I spend, I have spent a lot of my time when I'm doing business mentoring on helping women to look at how it actually benefits the family for them to heal their money story and then go out and learn how to make friends with it, create it and spend the time in, uh, that the, like Marianne Williams says, wealth creation, there's an engine, that, there's something that needs to be driving yeah. that. So, um, have you, have you ever, okay. So with, with what we call like lack mentality and the deeper issues around, you know, abundance, um, blocks or whatever you want to call it, what you're talking about scripting and doing all of these things. Um, mm -hmm. what do you think is the real bottom like if you were just to take even those five things, survival, just enough, hot mess, money chaser, and you just climbed under that even, and you just went into like the human psyche, what do you think it is about abundance blocks and lack mentality? What do you think it's really about if you had to guess? Like the deeper issue. I mean, I think for me, what I've seen is each one of those has their own deeper issue. Like it has its own, um, you know, survival is very much about safety. Um, just enough is I can't ask for anything. It's this deeply rooted, like chaser is really wanting to be enough in yourself. Um, hot mess is, is really about, there's a craving of spirituality under there and wanting more that sort of awakens at some point. Um, and it is so interesting. I think a lot of it has to do with their temperament um, and, and it's usually fear-based. So how, yeah, I guess the love part, that's where it comes in with making friends with it, right? Because the opposite of fear is love. So with the law of attraction, mm -hmm. um, what are the most powerful ways that you've seen, especially with respect to what we're talking about around the creation of a new way of looking at money and forging healthier beliefs so that you can receive more because our brain is always sending out these signals, our body, our energy is already sending out the signals we're really <laughs> not even aware of. And so how have you seen the law of attraction work in that? I know you touched on it a little bit, but what do, what do you see as the most powerful ways to use this? I know there's a short and a long game with it. Yeah. So I, going for the long game. So becoming the person that you want to be. Um, and I think I had this from my own personal experience, you know, I want more money for this, or I want a client or I want this and I would try and manifest. And often I was, it was even trying to manifest the how, and I wasn't getting what I want. Um, but when I, even though I would be really good at manifesting something, it would end up not getting me what I wanted. Like I thought it would, um, and so I talk a lot about the short game versus the long game. And the short game is like, oh, I want a new car, right? And the long game is becoming the person who could always buy a new car if they wanted, um, you know, who has the money there or, um, you know, being able to, you know, the short game is sort of, oh, I want to manifest like a thousand dollars for this vacation. And again, the, the long game is becoming the person who a can receive the money all the time and has money all the time. Um, but becoming the person who 
could always take a vacation if they wanted or always has a vacation planned um, around the corner because the money's always there. And so it's becoming worthy of everything that you want, but it's really this long term, long game. I call it long game. So um, I work 90 days when we're manifesting money. We work in that short time frame to sort of build up some manifesting muscles and to shift perspective. And then we switch over to five years out. Who do you want to be five years from now? What is the life you want to be living five years from now? Not what's the list of sort of the stuff that you want in your life, but what do you want that everyday experience to be? So you talked a lot about freedom. Like, do you want to have freedom in your schedule? Do you want to be surrounded by friends and family? Do you want to be living at the beach? You know, do you want to be walking on the beach every day? Um, Really shifting that to becoming um, the person in five years and putting that as your focus is what I've seen to be the most successful and has helped me create the best life ever is really who do I want to be five years from now? And how am I taking the steps to become that person today? Hmm. Yeah. And I think really taking the time to just develop that inside your mind space, having a vision for that. And you mentioned feelings, how we ask ourselves, you know, how do I want to feel or how's it going to feel when this happens, when I manifest this and just developing those, um, I don't want to say emotions, it's this pure feeling that drives it to you more more efficiently and faster when you say it's just the development of the the more specific you are and the more you feel into it yeah and i think people confuse specificity um i was actually interviewing a client a couple weeks ago and she was when we first started working together she was really trying to go like the specifics because other people had said like you have to get so specific it's the blue car with the white stripe with the the Mm. stereo and the this And, um, it's really letting go. Like, do I feel free when I drive that car? Like what's the experience getting into our senses as well is very important. So I think a lot of people try and force this feeling that they don't know, but when you enact, um, your senses, you involve like, okay, what do I see? Um, it becomes more of an experience and that makes the feeling a lot easier. Mm, yeah, I love. So a lot of my research has has been focused in the realm of emotional healing has been focused on multisensory healing. And like you were just saying, employing the senses and using them as our creation vehicles and our feel good portals. And I never really equated that with law of attraction. Um, so I just had a big aha. So thanks. <laughs> But it makes you're sense. welcome. It makes awesome. Sense. <laughs> okay. Well, is there anything else, yeah. Cassie, that you would say to our listeners um, about creating a new money story or looking at money differently? Or maybe they're, I mean, here we are at the beginning of a new year. And so a lot of people, maybe they have a business idea or they have a project in mind or something they've always wanted to do. And there's just some reticence around fully embracing that because of the fear of money and not having that safety net. Can you maybe round out our discussion with that? Yeah. So most people, even with just the little description I gave of each story, will be able to pick out their money story. And so the thing that you can do today, as soon as this podcast is over, is just become aware. Like, oh, if you thought your survival, like, oh, do I get rid of money as soon as it comes? You know, um, am I trying to hot potato it or or do I have this, am I chasing money? Am I like having, you know, it's, you know, only been like a month into the new year. Am I like have 10 new money generating ideas? Um, and really just become aware is the first, becoming aware is the first step. Like, oh, okay, I did get rid of that money. Like, who do I want to be instead? Ah, oh, I feel safe when I have money, not when I'm in panic, right? Mm. So just become aware of how your story is playing out and choose something different. If you realize like, oh yeah, I've had 10 business ideas, ask yourself, well, what do I really want? I want enough money to feel safe and then work from there and just start practicing. I have enough money to feel safe, right? And when that other idea comes, just remind yourself and pause. I have enough money to feel safe and um, wait for the idea that's really, you know, I'm talking to the money chasers, but the idea that is really the big idea and not just the idea that you're going to chase for two minutes. Um, But really you can start today with the awareness and then just choosing, like getting clear 
okay, what do I want instead of that? What do I want? Who do I want to be when it comes to money and having money and my relationship with money? Hmm. Yeah, powerful. Well, that's an amazing way for us to close out. And I would just invite listeners to find you. And we will, uh, can you just share with us how the best place, how, where, what, when, how (laughs) the best place to reach you and connect? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. If you want to go to my website, it's Cassie, C-A-S-S-I-E, parks.com. If you're a reader, just type Cassie Parks into Amazon and all of my books will come up and pick the one that calls to you. If you want to know more about manifesting $10,000, there's a book for that. Um, And so just, yeah, go about it that way. Perfect. Thank you so much, Cassie, for your time. Thank you, Sherry, for having me. This has been amazing. I love this whole idea that we get to literally create our own reality and that we do it spiritually before we do it physically. So the whole idea about having your mind and heart and gut in the right space and how you perceive the resource and value of money exchange, currency, how it flows to you and through you and back from you to others. To me, it's about having more so you can give more, so you can be opened up to more freedom and more possibilities. I like how Cassie talked about You have to be what you want to attract. So if you're not vibing at the level that you want to receive or not vibing at the level of of what it is you want, it's going to be a little difficult for it to come into your space. So that's why we're all here together to be reminders of each other of what is possible. How it's not about the love of money necessarily, but what you can create with it. So this has been a journey in my life of which I'm very grateful, having severe lack during different times of my life, and then also receiving abundance and issuing and showing forth gratitude for what is, no matter what is the reality, because that brings more to you as well. So keep following us on Women Seeking Wholeness Facebook page. And also, of course, just telling your girlfriends about this, because I know you're going to love what we've got coming up in this first quarter of the year with emotional healing. We're going to do a whole series on emotional healing. So that will be forthcoming and have a great week. We'll see you next time on Women Seeking Wholeness.